Um, so let's say we just said that, for instance, um, the, so let's, start, let's compare the lower heating value, for instance, of gasoline is something like 16 kilowatt hours per kilogram. 16, 18, something like that. Um, the lower heating value of hydrogen is um, 33 kilowatt hours per kilogram. 120 megajoules per kilogram. Um, uh, so it's much higher, right? But this is per unit of mass, right? So hydrogen is an H2. It's got very, very low mass. But there's a lot of energy in those hydrogen bonds, right? Um, and then, for instance, if we talked about batteries, the, you know, let's just talk about lithium ion batteries. And we, there's not really an equivalent to lower heating value here, but the battery um, you know, would be at about, uh, I said, 150 watt hours per kilogram. Right? So factor of you know, this 90 difference or whatever. Right? Lot, very large difference. And, and implicit in this calculation is even actually that, you know, so, so this is not quite fair because gasoline, to make energy that's useful, you have to put it through an engine, which might be 15 or 30% efficient or whatever. But, you know, you can do those calculations. But the global idea here is gasoline is a really good fuel relative to uh, batteries, and hydrogen is even better. I mean, hydrogen is even better. Now, what's the problem with hydrogen? I mean... It's easy to. No source of hydrogen. Well, that's not it. That's, that doesn't bug me. I mean, <laughs> okay. Driving. Just yeah. Okay. I mean, all right. So right. There's. I mean, except for. Right. I mean, but also hydrogen. I mean, the hydrogen is everywhere, right? I mean, it's in water or something. We have. We have to refine crude oil to make gasoline. You could get it out of water. I mean, it's not like there's not enough H's in the world. Uh, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of transportation, the real problem is storage, is that this is a liquid, and so it has a density of, uh, uh, you know, this is getting confusing here, but <clears throat> gasoline has a density of, it's on the, you remember, it's, it's on the order of like 0 0.7578, something like that. Um, kilograms per meter cube, uh, I'm sorry, per liter, kilograms per liter. Um, the density of hydrogen, and uh, don't quote me on this, but is 8 in 1,000 kilograms per liter. And so, you, you know, you, so in order to store this energy, you have to squeeze it really hard, right? And so hydrogen tanks in cars are... Um, you know, are, uh, op are, are at 10,000 psi. So, so this is the problem for hydrogen in transportation. There'd be, it would, you know, and, and uh, you know, everybody, the dream would be, of course, we, we should just combust hydrogen. It'd be easy to do, and we could use the technology we already have, and it'd be great. The only problem is that we just can't, we can't put hydrogen on a car very efficiently. If you use it, you know, if you put it on a car, you better be really careful to use it really efficiently, and so that's where fuel cells kind of come in. Um, so gives you a little idea there. All right, so this, so there's you know, the global idea is there's an, basically a real compromise that we would like to have, we'd like to have gasoline to do the stuff like steady state driving, and we'd like to have gasoline to do the stuff that it does well, and we'd like to have batteries on board to do the stuff that it does well. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into the idea of engines, you know, you guys, especially all on the physics and technology side, understand the, but the, the idea is, of course, it produces work from thermodynamics. And a little bit of idea, um, you know, I just want to talk about this as it references the thing that we've already talked about, which is those engine maps. So this is a, you know, an example of a four-stroke spark ignited gasoline engine just like is in all of the cars that are hybrid cars that you'll find out there. Um, and an important part here is this throttle, okay? So the throttle chokes the engine. 
So that what it does is, you know, again, we talk, if, if we think about this as, as being a PDV, this DV changes with the piston going up and down, and then the pressure is the P, right? And so what the throttle does, I mean, in generalities, is that it lowers the pressure that is inside of the cylinder and produces, the, the engine produces less work when the throttle is closed and there's, uh, you know, it's blocking the airflow in there. It's, it's the, the air, fuel ratio is always staying the same, so it's got less fuel in there, but it's also lowering the pressure. So it ca it's a cause of losses in there. So if we looked at this map that we talked about before, we can start to understand why is it the, the efficiency gets higher and higher when the throttle gets higher and higher. It's because that throttle plate is flattening out. It has less losses over it. That's not choking the engine out. And um, so that's why, in general, this gets more efficient at higher throttle. This is an example, again, you know, so th this is uh, data collected on a urban driving schedule for a car. And if you can, you know, with, with this particular transmission controller or whatever it is, you can see that it has lots of points that it's operating at relatively low speed, at relatively low um, engine power, but on average maybe it's making about what we were talking about earlier. On average over the whole drive cycle, if I was to sort of point to the middle of the cloud, it might be 10 kilowatts, right? And so this, this one gets 18 miles per gallon. If we control it a little bit better, and it's not really doing all that much, I mean, the average is still 10 kilowatts or so. It, you know, it didn't make any more power, didn't do anything crazy. We just kind of controlled it a little bit better. Uh, we brought up the speed a little bit and made it so it's doing less of this kind of like muddy idling, uh, idling down here, and we can get on the order of 23 miles per gallon or whatever, right? Same sort of, same sort of idea, but it gives you an idea for, for instance, you know, in that case, we moved from a efficiency, maybe an average efficiency of, you know, 800 grams per kilowatt hour to an average efficiency that might be 600 grams per kilowatt hour. Imagine how beautiful it could be if we could get 255 grams per kilowatt hour. Um, you know, we could, do, we could do that calculation to figure out what the fuel economy of that vehicle would be, but it would be, uh, you know, it's on the order of, uh, you know, 80 or 100 miles per gallon or whatever. So that's the that's sort of the most efficiency that you could get out of an engine. We should probably just do that because it's kind of it's kind of fun anyway. Um, if you like doing calculations, which I do, <laughs> I'm guilty always of that. So um, okay. So basic idea here is let's talk about the um, the engine is going to operate at let's say 255 grams per kilowatt hour. So for instance, let's drive a car at um, an average speed, uh, you know, I, let's do our 60 miles an hour thing. So we're going to operate our Chevy Malibu, and we know the Chevy Malibu goes, 10, uh, goes 60 miles an hour at 10 kilowatts. So if I do this and multiply it by 10 kilowatts, and we're going to operate at, um, we're going to operate at, um, you know, 60 miles per hour, then basically what we can get here is uh, something that has units of grams per kilowatt. I need to, I need to do this one, one over 60 there. Sorry about that. Mile per hour. We're going to get grams per mile, right? 42 grams per mile. And we want to end up with a number that's like miles per gallon or whatever, right? So let's just divide this, you know, so 1 over 42 uh, grams per mile. And we've got, um, you know, our density of fuel we said was 0. Point, let's use um, 0.75 grams, I'm sorry, kilograms per liter, so 750 750 grams per liter, and there are 3.8 liters per gallon, right? So that should give us miles per gallon, 750. 750 times 3.8 over 42.
68 miles per gallon. Okay, so that's so like right there. So with with this engine, which is not you know there's nothing wrong with that engine or whatever, the most we could possibly hope for in terms you know so and and so this basically says even if we downsized everything, even if we got the best sized engine and it was just perfect so that we put the center of this cloud right at the center of that whole thing, everything worked great. It's it's you know there's no losses, there's no efficiencies, there's no anything. We get 68 miles per gallon. Period, right? It's not. It's it's it turns out it's really hard to you know you can imagine. I mean, it's hard to get 68 miles per gallon. I mean, so so, um, and that's steady state driving at 60 miles an hour or whatever. Not it's not even talking about stops and starts and idling and air conditioning and whatever else, right? But it kind of you know it gives you an idea. Like so, this is so engine constrained. There's just no way that we, you know, we, we might dream of 200 mile per gallon cars or something like that. But if it's got an engine in it, you're not going to be able to get too much better than this. Now, the, I, so now the, 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 um, the, the Prius has a, uh, you know, it has a fancier engine than this one, and it can get down to 230 or something like that grams per kilowatt hour. Well, so I urge you repeat the calculation and see what the maximum, um, you know, the maximum fuel economy that a Prius could get and you'll be, you know, you'll be underwhelmed, right? I mean, again, like, you just can't get 200 miles per gallon out of, out of internal combustion engines. So, yeah, you could make a more efficient car, right? I mean, so, for instance, if you made a car that had better aerodynamics, you could change that number, absolutely. Um, if you had a car that, for instance, if you had a better engine, then you could change that number. If you had a better, you know, if you had a fuel that had more energy or something like that, you could change that number. But um, anyway, it, it, it's, it, it's always interesting, right, to look at sort of limiting cases. So um, now, what this really shows us, of course, is that the efficiency of the car, if, whether it's hybrid or not, is very dependent on the efficiency of the engine. Like, it's part of the package, right? And um, so, it turns out, of course, that the engines that are in hybrids are not just your, you know, grandfather's engines or whatever, right? They are fancy engines. They are very well uh, developed specific to this application. So. There's a couple of different technologies that are out there to be able to improve the efficiency of engines. And those, were the ones that, you know, that are most common right now are what are, you can call them either Miller or Atkinson cycle, depending on the book that you use or whatever. It's a little bit of a gray area in between Miller and Atkinson cycle engines. Um, but the global idea is that what these let, uh, both of these different types of engines, have um, a specific advantage, and that's that they have different expansion and compression ratios. Now, it's weird to think about that, but the idea is that, um, you know, like the piston is going up and down, right? And in a conventional auto cycle engine, the expansion, the, the I'll say it again, the, in the conventional auto cycle engine, the compression ratio and the compression stroke length is the same as the expansion stroke length. That seems obvious to us all, right? If you've ever looked at an engine or take looked at an engine textbook or anything else like that, right? That the expansion and the compression stroke are of the same length. In an Atkinson cycle engine or a Miller cycle engine, they have some clever ways to make it so that the compression stroke is of different length than the expansion stroke. So the, the compre you know, so for instance, what would a, what would a four cycle engine look like that had different expansion and compression strokes? It would look like Compression, expansion, exhaust, intake, compression, expansion, exhaust, intake, compression, expansion. You know, so see what I'm saying? They would have different lengths. So let's look at what there are some kind of ways that that can actually happen. Um, this is an example, a really old, this is the way when Atkinson built his engine. Atkinson was a, was a, uh, guy who was, who was uh, in the same time period as Otto. And so he decided to make a engine and patent that that would get around Otto's patents. And so he designed this engine that 
It's a little bit hard to see, and this one is not super obvious, but it's got this funny mechanism down here that actually lets it have different expansion and compression ratios. Um, it's not super dramatic in that one. The other, um, let's see here, Th this is also a, uh, you know, but that's actually not what's in a Prius. What's in a Prius is what's called late intake valve closing. And what that is, is that, you know, instead of having this cycle that, that is mechanically of different lengths, what they do is they have the intake valve and they close the intake valve late. And what that does is it, um, let's look at this, right? Uh, you know, tell me if I'm boring y'all, but the basic idea is like what would happen is if you hold this, let's, you know, I'll, this hand will be that intake valve. And what will happen is, for instance, we would have a um, compression stroke and an expansion stroke and an exhaust stroke. And then the intake stroke, the intake valve would open. You would have an intake. And then it starts the compression stroke. But instead of closing this valve, like one might expect to begin the compression stroke, it leaves that valve open. And the fuel-air mixture actually returns to the intake manifold. And so what happens is it kind of closes this valve halfway up. And if it closes that valve halfway up, you only get half the compression stroke length than you do the exhaust stroke length equivalent. It's weird to think about, but the global idea is what you can do is you, you know, instead of having, you know, if most engines will auto ignite at a compression ratio, you know, with conventional fuel at like 10 and a half to one or something like that. What you can do is you can design a engine like the Prius that has a compression ratio of 13. And you just make sure that that intake valve closes a little bit late. In fact, 10 thirteenths of the way up or you know, three thirteenths of the way up, so that that intake valve stays open, the cylinder is coming, and you close that intake valve, perform the compression stroke, ex you know, combustion, expansion, exhaust, intake, the intake valve opens, it pushes that charge back in there, closes off, and does a shortened compression stroke. It's really cool. That's, That's called an... You're reducing some of the resistance of... What it, so what it's doing is, it, what it allows you to do is get more work. So the idea is that P delta V, it changes, instead of changing P, it now makes that delta V of the expansion stroke bigger, which is the dream. It makes it so you get more energy out of the combustion. Does that also increase the efficiency of the fuel then? Not appreciably. Okay. It doesn't change the combustion very much, but it does change this expansion. Nope. It doesn't, just literally doesn't change the control hardly at all. The way to think about it is that you get the same, you get the same P, you get the same combustion, it's just you get more delta V. So instead of your, you know, all, what always, you know, the exhaust in a car is hot. It has, it has, you know, call it availability or enthalpy, enthalpy or whatever you want to call it. It ha still has energy in it that you can extract. And if you allow more delta V, you get cooler exhaust, there's more energy transferred to the crankshaft, and the engine is more efficient, and that's the whole deal. Hmm. It's amazing. I, yeah, in my, it's so counterintuitive. It's, yeah, so. Let some out, and you get. So the idea is what you do is, you again, like instead, instead of building an engine that has a compression ratio of 10 and a half to 1, a mechanical compression and expansion ratio of 10 and a half to 1, you build one that has 13. And that way, you still have a real compression ratio of 10 and a half, you just get an extra expansion. You get that 13 to 1 expansion without ratio. Changing. Without changing, without having any funny mechanisms or anything else like that. So, you know, I gave you one example. Here's another one. This is a company called Scuderi that's trying to design Miller cycle engines. This is what they have to do to make a Miller cycle without doing late intake valve closing or anything else like that. This, this is complicated. It's expensive. It's wary. You know, there's wear involved, whatever. Uh, you know, that's not to... I, you know, I'm not, I'm not really an expert or whatever in, in IC engine design, but it, it's much less, this is less elegant, I think, than the uh, late intake valve closing mechanism. But the global idea, again, I mean, to me, the takeaway that I really want to think about is some of this is that, um, you know, that the engines are part of the system. We have to think about using all the parts of the system more efficiently in order to get it to work better. I, I just included these because they're really cool. They're a bunch of, um, of things that you can, you know, have the students think about or whatever. But it's basically, you know, I, I can, 
I'm always wary of using YouTube in class, especially with college students, because there's always something inappropriate on the side of YouTube. But um, anyway, these are some things that are like engine buildup um, CAD drawings and stuff that are really cool, in my opinion, if people like those kind of things. So anyway, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about on the engines front, um, is that, you know, uh, hyperelectric vehicle engines actually are different than conventional vehicle engines. And the, re you know, the reason we can get away with some of these fancy things is that the engine is not being demanded. There's not as much demanded of the engine in terms of its dynamics, in terms of its power output, and in terms of all these things. Its new job in a hyperelectric vehicle is produce power very efficiently at a couple of very defined conditions that are steady state conditions. And if the designer of the vehicle can make that happen, then there's real advantages Can in terms of fuel economy. Direct injection? About yeah. So, um, so direct injection is a mo is a means to improve the efficiency of combustion. So, you know, again, like there's, uh, um, and the basic idea of that is that you have, um, you know, so in a conventional four-stroke engine. Let's look at this again here. You've got fuel injectors are actually in the intake manifold. And um, so when they inject, they literally will spray on the wall of the intake manifold. They spray on this valve. They do all sorts of things that you would imagine are not actually super optimal in terms of getting entrainment of the fuel into the air mixture and all this kind of stuff. Direct injection is where you can actually put this fuel injector right on the cylinder. It directly injects into the cylinder, and you can do all, that's really, it it's, can be nice because you can do some stuff like actually get it to interact with the piston bowl and get really nice swirl and good mixing and everything like that. The hard, the, the, so there are advantages to that. The reason that it's hard to do is because you now have a, you know, you've got an injector in the cylinder, in cylinder. And so it takes higher injection pressures. It's a more robust injector, more expensive injector, all this kind of stuff like that. That's right. Yeah. So the, the, your the, the accelerator pedal does not change the throttle, is what you want to say, right? Yeah. So um, right. And in the case of a hybrid electric vehicle, the the accelerator pedal now means something different. It doesn't mean remove choke from the engine intake manifold. It means I want torque, right? And so the vehicle control system is is to decide how you will get that proportion between the engine and between the electric motor and such. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so let's see. We, so the last thing I was going to talk about is a little bit about electric motors. Because electric, mo you know, electric motors are sort of the other half of the powertrain, right? Um, the basic idea, and again, you guys will be familiar with this, you know, is that you know, what we're trying to do is, is generate mechanical work from electrical work, right? So we have current and voltage, and we're trying to turn that into torque and speed. And um, the way to do that in electric motors is basically through magnetic fields, right? So electricity flowing through the coils of the electric motor creates a magnetic field. They interact with magnetic fields from either coils or permanent magnets and um, produce rotational motion, right? And we sort of talked about this. Almost every motor can operate in what are called four quadrants. So if you drew a diagram that was, you know, torque and speed, that they can operate in both plus and minus torque, plus and minus speed, um, that, you know, any of those are available. So, and in hybrid electric vehicles, they're used basically for, motors used for propulsion and energy recover, recovery, like regenerative braking. So, you know, part of the questions that we want to try to answer here are like, what makes us want to put these in the vehicles? Why, what are the characteristics that have to be met in order to, you know, have them be part of automotive systems? And, um, you know, how do we design electric motors to think about them? So electric motors have a couple of sort of very interesting advantages. Um, when I, were we to draw, for instance, the um, torque versus speed curve of, an of a gasoline engine, it has some things that are kind of a drag. In ter if, if, you know, as an engineer. 
So let's draw that here. You know, so this is torque. This is speed. Um, and if I, I'll draw this diagram, and it'll, you know, we'll interpret it in a second here. So this is maybe a typical torque speed relationship for a gasoline internal combustion engine. There's a couple of things we can identify here, right? What is what do we call this point right here? This speed. It's a speed under which the engine can generate no torque, generates no power. It's called idle, right? I mean, like, if the, if, if the engine is running at idle speed, it basically generates zero torque, can't do any work, and um, that's all you can do, right? What about this? What we call, you know, what would you call the speed over which the engine can generate no torque, can generate no power? maximum speed of the engine, right? We call it redline or something like that, right? Sort of like, uh, so there's a maximum speed that you can't generate any power over. There's a minimum speed you can't generate any power under. What about the, you know, this would be 100% throttle line, right? Maximum torque, pedal to the metal all the way along, right? And it just so turns out, I mean, most engines sort of look like this where they have a maximum torque. You know, this T max does not necessarily occur at maximum speed. It's usually a little bit below there. Um, you know, but most engines sort of look just like this, all right? Now, there's some things that are kind of a drag about this, okay? so. If, for instance, um, the first thing is this idle is really annoying. It makes it so that you have to, you have to, you know, when you start a car, you have to throttle the throttle a little. You have to feather the throttle. You have to feather the clutch to get it to launch right, and it's it's hard to do, and it's hard for computers to do, and it's hard for automatic transmissions to do. Um, so that's really a, that's really a bummer. The second thing is actually that the because the the uh, the torque actually increases with increasing RPM that if you want to drive a car fast, you, can't, you have to keep it at like 4,000 RPM so you can make lots and lots of torque at, uh, at, at relatively high speed here, right? So you have to sort of keep the engine operating, you know, maybe in this region for high performance. But you have to keep, remember we sort of talked about that you have to keep the engine operating at a little bit lower speed for, um, so for your high performance region is going to be maybe out, you know, out here or something like that. And your high efficiency region is going to be out here. They're sort of in different places. And you sort of say, God, that's really, that's really hard to do. And the t you know, for instance, if I drew lines of constant power on this diagram, you guys will recall that power is equal to torque times omega. And so a line of constant power is a hyperbola on this graph like this. And so, um, you know, there's only one place that it makes maximum power. You have to be at 6,000 RPM all the way throttle, all the way open to be able to get maximum power. Um, so if you're climbing a hill, for instance, you, ha you know, you're climbing up the Vale grade and you want to go as fast as you possibly can, you have to let it, like, be screaming at you at 6,000 RPM, like, wah, as you go up the hill to make it work. All those things are really, you know, sort of if you take a step back, you sort of say, God, that's really hard in terms of powertrain control. So electric motors are really nice because what their torque speed relationships look like is this. Uh, that's, this is actually, um, so this is, I'll, I'll draw it just so we don't get confused by that graph. Draw it on the same sort of axes here. But the global idea is that the, its speed, torque speed relationship is just beautiful in terms of being able to control a car. It looks something like this. We've got this torque here and speed. Um, now, it has no idle, of course, right? The electric motor doesn't have to idle in order to maintain itself or whatever. It gets maximum torque at zero speed. Right? Can you sort of, so that's this, this graph here is actually the torque graph. So it gets maximum torque at, at basically zero speed. So you can just put the pedal to the metal and it goes boop and you drive away with no idle, no launch, no torque converter, no clutches, no anything like that. Then it, um, it has this 
region that's, you know, this is what's, uh, this, this speed right here is called base speed, and this is the, um, this is what's called a flux weakened region or whatever, but it's not really that big of a deal. But the idea is that you have a region that is actually at constant power. So remember I drew those, um, I drew hyperbolas to represent lines of constant power. Well, in an electric motor, it will generate constant power. Um, so it, for instance, if this is a 75 kilowatt electric motor, then this will be 75 kilowatts from 1,500 RPM to 4,000 or 5,000 RPM, all the way out. It's making constant power. So if you're driving up the highway at, uh, you know, at up, up the Vail grade again, you can drive up the Vail grade at 1,500 RPM and still make max power. So it's there's so, you know, again like no idle, this beautiful high torque at zero RPM. This whole crazy thing about it can go backwards. It actually looks exactly the same going backwards as it does forward. It actually looks almost exactly the same going re reverse torque, regenerative, than it does going, uh, you know, putting, uh, putting out power as it does taking back power. So imagine, you know, like you can't, you can't uh, run your engine backwards and go in reverse. Well, you can in an electric motor. All these things are great, right? We, as a, as a um, automotive engineer, you'd say that's just that's just perfect. That's just what we want. Here's another advantage. So remember, we talked a little bit about you know we had some diagrams up there that were a uh, you know that were for instance grams per kilowatt hour, right? And if our grams per kilowatt hour maxes out at say 200 200 grams per kilowatt hour and has a it, it, so its minimum value is 200, its maximum value is 800. There's a four to one difference in efficiency between the peak and off-peak efficiencies, right? In an electric motor, this is a diagram that is actually, you know, so torque and speed, again, you can see this region of constant torque, a region of constant power. It's a little, you know, when you don't draw it on the board, it's like got a little rounded edges to it and stuff like that, but don't worry too much about that. Uh, but the idea here is this is a peak efficiency of instead th of 30%, this peak efficiency is 93%. And then this minimum efficiency over here is 75% or 80%. And so there's le the, the efficiency bands are broader. They're more, you know, the, instead of having an island, like, I'm, you know, we're sort of used to drawing this island so that it's 1 30th or 40th the size of the total band. Well, this is the 90% island here. And it's pretty much almost everything you're doing, except for really low speed or really high torque or whatever, right? So it's pretty, you know, there's not that much efficiency costs as you move around the electric motor. So instead of having to monitor the engine and keep it in just the right happy spot and all this kind of stuff with electric motors, you kind of just run it. And you'll get high efficiency no matter where you go. So that's great. Like I say, it's got, you know, it's got this nice torque versus and, and power um, sort of characteristics. It's controllable, it's smooth, it's quiet. They're, you, know, they're re you want it to be easily manufactured. That's a little bit hard to do, but obviously we have, a, we have very large electric motor manufacturing industries around the world. They're very high light reliability and low maintenance. I mean, basically, the comparison between maintaining an internal combustion engine and maintaining an electric motor is um, you know, night and day. You'll never replace IGBTs in an electric motor. They just don't. That they can, you can design them with, uh, you know, fatigue lives and all this kind of stuff like that that is, you know, much longer than the life of the car. Uh, a, it's the transistors that it's a, um, uh, yeah. So I can't. So because I'm on the spot, I can't remember what the G stands for. But gate bipolar transistors, integrated gate bipolar transistors. Sorry. Um, but it's basically the transistors that are switches, yeah, <laughs> that are switches that turn the electric motor on and off. So you have to, th these things are pulsing at, at, you know, to basically make AC out of the DC that comes in from the battery. So they're very, so that's the thing is like this, this kind of efficiency that I'm talking about is, is with the 
converter, you know, so it's all the power electronics and electric motors. So the electrical to mechanical efficiency. So imagine, for instance, you know, in your internal combustion engine, if you're, if you've, if you're generating 100 kilowatts at 30% efficiency, then, uh, you know, then there's 200 kilowatts that are coming out of the exhaust and radiator, right? And in this case, if you're generating 100 kilowatts at 90% efficiency, then there's only 10 kilowatts or whatever that are coming out of the radiator and there's no exhaust, right? So actually, they're very, they're, the heat generation is much, much less because they're so efficient. Does that sort of make sense, right? From the maintenance standpoint, the internal, you don't have the, well, you don't have the dirtiness from the fact that you're burning. That's right. Carbon buildup from the inflammation to oil and that constant, well, cooling and heating, cooling and contraction on the metal stuff, so that's why. Exactly. Yeah. Is that, the, you know, so that the, there's no, there's no, I mean, the things that ruin oil are, you know, blow-by and friction and, uh, you know, hot spots and concentrated heat and, you know, yeah, carbon from, that comes from the combustion and all that kind of stuff. And none of that's in electric motors. From a recurring maintenance standpoint yeah. for an owner. Yeah. You're still looking at tires. Brakes are much less now because we're regeneratively braking as well, right? So actually brake, brake wear goes down by, you know, factor of two or something like that. <laughs>